There's a moment in Hollow Knights where you walk into a subterranean city and approach Quarrel sitting comfortably on a bench. He's gazing out into the rain and you can see the water falling gently down the outside of the window. Quarrel says he wonders where all the rain is coming from since the city is underground. You hear the muffled splashes hitting the roof and a beautiful piano song dances in the background while you contemplate the puzzle. Amidst the forever loneliness of Hollow Knights, it's a serene moment of respite in a cruel, sad world. Very few games can capture an atmosphere that is not only full of charm, but also one that is immensely melancholy, dark and downcast. I really love playing through Hollow Knight, not just for this reason or for the great crispy gameplay, but also because the game has a lot of character and story gems. This is something you don't typically get with Metroidvanias. They tend to focus on the maze itself rather than the storytelling or the characters, as they're very gameplay driven experiences, often for the cheap. Hollow Knight actually has a touching story to fall back on, with many great characters filling in the spaces. Quarrel is someone we meet many times in Hollow Knight, and we do eventually discover why it rains in the City of Tears. And just like everything in the game, his finale is best summed up with two words. Woeful beauty. These words are essentially opposites, and that's what makes Hollow Knight one of my favorite games. There's a contrast to the game, a striking one at that, and it surrounds the entire experience. The world, its music, its story, and even the main character itself. Beady bug black eyes plastered on a rounded snow white face. Some characters feel lost and sad, others are jubilant and have more cartoon-like expressions like Myla, the happy miner who loves to sing and dig for crystals. She's a small beacon of light in the big dark world. Somehow her odd sense of naivety contrasts very well against the somber tones of Hollow Nest where everyone is supposed to rot away. Again with the contrast though, her story doesn't exactly end up happily ever after. Everything in Hollow Knight evokes this dark playfulness, one in which poison pits can reside comfortably next to soft, bouncy purple mushrooms. It's sorrow clashing with a juvenile sense of heroism. The music is similar in this regard as well, seesawing from sulking and oppressive to triumphant and playful. Hollow Knight is a mostly silent experience, with occasional soft music fading in and out depending on if you're in combat or not. While the music is unquestionably beautiful, so is the silence. In a world where sensory overload is far too common, Hollow Knight approaches sound design much more tactfully. Attacks, spells, and alerts from enemies are the loudest things in this game. Everything else is either mute or on a manageable level, which doesn't go unnoticed. It helps you stay in tune and focus. Obviously we have some catchy boss tunes which feed your adrenaline, but general exploration is typically relaxing, filled with ambient mise-en-scene and gentle piano keys. Environments also do a great job telling the story in this bichrome style. Hollow Knight is vast, but bleak and dark. Places with no light, spiders that fright have a care lest they bite. Despite it though, there's plenty of delights and incredible sights for our night. Hollow Knight's environments are exquisite, and the color palette is surprisingly bold and vibrant, ranging from emerald greens to deep blues, golds, pinks, and purples. Intense darkness sits side by side with blinding light. It's pleasantly surprising for a world below ground to have such a diverse color palette and it's also a nice refuge from the typical brown video game. And since the game is often very achromatic, when the colors come in they pop even more, making the bright feel brighter and the dark areas feel even darker. This is what is so immersive about the game. The arts and the music, they're so commingled and appealing and the controls are so precise on top. Hollow Knight is very dreamlike. The atmosphere and the art style bleed heartbreak into a world that has just lost its will to live yet not all of it. There's hope and romance tucked away in some unusual places in Hollow Knight, and it pulls you in close with the use of all these contrasting artistic and thematic elements. What's important beyond the wonderful visuals and the sound, though, is the playability of a game, of course. You can admire a game for its art, but deep down a game will only be as good as it feels in your hands. At least, that's what I think. Mechanics can be amplified when they're surrounded and supported by other things that makes them better, but they still have to stand on their own regardless, and Hollow Knight completely nails everything about its movements and its environmental design. In terms of how you play, Hollow Knight starts out slow, confusing, and even a little bit stiff. You only have a basic jump and a slash which is far removed from the insane amount of tools you'll get later on. Late game Hollow Knight feels nothing like it does at first, and you could argue that the progression is a little bit too slow. You'll wander for hours as you figure out the various maps. You'll backtrack and you'll get lost a ton. 
During this feel-out period, the game can come across as overly confusing and overly punishing, with a lack of a traditional map, long runbacks for bosses, and a complete lack of direction. In Hollow Knight, you have to get over this hump to truly enjoy the game, as during this time you will not get many upgrades. It's both a blessing and a curse, as many games give you all of your power-ups in the first few hours and save very little for the end. In these games, it's easy to have all of your fun early and simply burn out halfway through. Hollow Knight is actually the opposite. It takes a long time to ramp up, but it gives you new skills to play around with all the way up to the very end. So while a double-edged sword, perhaps it's sharpened on the right side. Regardless, many hours later, you'll have a whole suite of tricks you can use, and honestly, it feels like a completely different game. The mechanics of Hollow Knight allow for absolute control, which is the most important thing for any game like this. The Knight has many options for movements, and the developers opted for a pressure-sensitive jump, in which you can jump higher or lower depending on how you interact with that button. More pressure leads to a higher and or longer jump whereas less pressure leads to a lower and or shorter jump. At first, the somewhat finicky nature of it feels a little bit floaty and not very precise. But in time, it allows for complete user control because you can dictate precisely the amount of space you want to cover on both the horizontal and vertical plane. And that little bit of leeway you get midair awards you the time to make small adjustments. Without it, you wouldn't be able to react in real time as fast, and thereby the game wouldn't have been able to present difficult platforming scenarios like this. Thus, it's a mechanic that has a higher skill requirement, but with that comes the potential for much higher utilization at the same time. Eventually you'll be doing some pretty fancy stuff in Hollow Knight. The knight has a jump, a double jump, an infinite wall jump, a dash, a super dash, and can pogo hop with his nail onto enemies. When you combine all the elements together, it leads to all sorts of stunts you can pull off, and using wall jumping, terrain sliding, and super dashing allow you to reset your normal jumps and dashes, which can result in crazy platforming possibilities. The amount of control you have during these movements is incredible, and this is one of the great joys of playing this game. Team Cherry presents awesome challenges, and I can recall so many moments where I was zipping and flying through the air, grinning from ear to ear once I mastered the mechanics. There's so much opportunity to mix and match the various options together that you can truly navigate obstacles in many different ways and kind of create your own style as you play. Granted, it would have been nice to have some better instruction for some of these mechanics. Some things just don't get explained, like how the game doesn't mention how to pogo hop pretty much at all. This technique is fairly important for some areas and can make platforming a lot easier. Not only does it act like a free jump button, but it also lets you dive or jump afterwards to reach higher places in one seamless animation. It's a useful tool at all stages, especially during the White Palace, where pogo hopping on moving objects is required. The game also doesn't mention the quick cast button, or that you can mash the attack button during Cyclone Slash. This ups the hit count from 3 to 7. Very useful for one one-shotting enemies in the Colosseum. Using Quick Cast shoots your spell when you press the button versus when you release it, which results in the spell coming out slightly faster with the Quick Cast button. Hollow Knight can be a game of milliseconds, and anything that can potentially aid the player shouldn't be left to chance. Not everyone looks over the controller button map in the menu. Still, all of your actions are so clear during platforming and combat, and that clarity extends to the level design too, which is arguably even more important. The most critical element when designing a 2D platformer is to make sure the player knows exactly what is the background and what is the foreground. 2D games have a huge challenge of filling up the game space in a way that can be instantly downloaded by the player looking at it. After all, most platformers are a reflex test, and if there's ever a moment of indecision, it could lead to taking damage or death. Hollow Knight takes a layered approach to its graphics, and it makes damn sure you know exactly what is the playable game space and what is decoration. The various planes are always, always very distinct. This room in the hive is a good example of what I'm talking about. Look at how many layers there are. 12. 12 layers here. Foreground rocks, multiple layers of eggs, the pathway, the spiky wall, the stalactite in the foreground, the five layers in the background, and the buzzing bee silhouettes. This is an insane amount of layers, yet nothing gets obfuscated at all due to how they were individually treated. Everything has the proper focus, and you notice as things get pushed back further into the frame, they get blurrier and fuzzier. There's even five different hues of the color gold here. Even when objects are in front of you, they're always transparent so you know where you're at at all times. These are basic filmmaking techniques, but you'd be surprised how many games screw them up. You only need to play a game like Axiom Verge to see how a busy screen space can get very, very messy, and results in difficulty picking out what is the playable space from what is not. Hollow Knight has so much going on too, but the visuals never get in the way of the gameplay, with the use of the parallaxing field of view and the smart color choices, which leads to precise, enjoyable platforming throughout.
Because everything is so readable, the mechanics award you instantaneous decision making, which is what all the work went in for after all. You have so much flexibility to save yourself from near death situations with its various mechanics, and it's only because the game is so clear that you can thread that line in that moment. There are a few flashy spell effects and some hard to spot enemy projectiles, but overall the clarity and control of Hollow Knight is spot on. This is why Hollow Knight feels very hypnotic to play. The mechanics, level design, and combat are so fluid that you can swim through the world in a trance-like state as you explore the unknowns, and that is what I really, really love about this game. However, I think you have to be a certain gamer to appreciate Hollow Knight's or really any Metroidvania game. I didn't grow up in the era of convenience or handholding. I had no quest arrows to follow and dying often had dire consequences. The games of my past were relentless and unforgiving. I can respect a game like Celeste that streamlines death in the general sense of direction a player should be moving. It's simple and it's effective, and it discards many annoying elements prevalent in retro gaming. But there's something to say about uncovering a world little by little. That kind of majesty is hard to capture in a great draw of Hollow Knight, even if that means a brutal death system, lots of backtracking, and an overall lack of convenient systems. The games aren't that similar in many regards, but it does highlight the punishing nature of Hollow Knight still, and worth mentioning as I consider Hollow Knight and Celeste the two great indie masterpieces of our time. Granted, some additional quality of life features would have been nice. The ability to see yourself on the map really should have been in by default. Charm slots are hard to come by and asking players to give up one for that basic information is perhaps a little bit too harsh. It's also a little off-putting that the game doesn't update as you explore. It's frustrating at first to feel like you're being kicked while you're already down. However, this system does at least stop you from constantly pulling up your map, which is something that does detract from enjoying exploration. The map design itself is massive and nothing short of amazing, but they could have been a little bit more generous with fast travel options and bench placement if you ask me. They could have at least sprinkled in a few more benches in some of the more open areas. The various fast travel systems are nice, such as the Dream Nail, when you do get to the end game. but during a first time playthrough, getting to and fro can be more of a hassle than it should be. Backtracking is prevailing, and though I'm not usually opposed to it when there's a degree of persistent challenge involved, often it's more of an autopilot affair, and thus, fairly unengaging. The runbacks to certain bosses are also pretty grueling, and after playing Elden Ring, I don't know how I feel about them. The goal of a game is to challenge you in the moment, and if you've shown the game you can get past an area and to a boss, does it really make sense for you to have to prove it again and again simply because that boss killed you? Hollow Knight is a game of learning attack patterns and a system of trial and error, which is fine but this does come with heavy backtracking implications. Certain bosses in Hollow Knight have very sudden, almost gimmicky tactics that can surprise you like the Soul Master. So it's not uncommon to die a few times before you learn how to beat them, and having to run back through huge areas where you're not really being tested leads me to wonder if a boss checkpoint system should have been considered. Games can't have their cake and eat it too though. Every feature comes with a cost, that's why there is no perfect video game, and why Metroidvania games are relatively niche. Add in a follow me quest era or some more benches and you've gained convenience but you've sacrificed some of the feeling of adventure. Leave them out and you've got players feeling like a true explorer but they might get frustrated at the lack of direction or the hassle of everything. Think of any gameplay feature ever made, it's going to come with a trade-off. Hollow Knight's world design is one of its biggest strengths, yet that trade-off is that it's pretty damn intimidating. It can make you feel lost and defeated and hopeless, even though its highs are so high. To be left alone to explore a big world and figure things out for yourself can be a true wonder, but that also can be a means to alienation. Hollow Knight has an infectious charm to it, and it hits at the hearts of what makes a great Metroidvania game. Its faults are so easy to forgive when you realize how generous, huge, fun, and inspiring Hollow Nest is. It gives you everything you want, and then some. It might be a game about killing bugs, but it's so much more than that. Hollow Knight kept me glued to my chair with its sense of discovery, exciting gameplay, wondrous dark visuals, and its dedication to precision. But I'm going to remember it for being so much more than that. I noodle around my house, humming its music. I wonder about its characters and their unceremonious fates. I think about its story before I go to bed sometimes. A numb sadness and a hopeful melancholy. Some of its story bits hit hard, and you might be surprised to find terrific yet very subtle storytelling in Hollow Knight, with some poignant moments hidden in between. I won't say too much, but yeah, Old Stag almost made me shed a tear. Hollow Knight never tries to show off, it's humble, it asks you to read between the lines, and strikes a chord against all of the tell games out there. The world needs more show games like Hollow Knight. It is simply one of the best games I've ever played. Later on in the game, Quirrell and Knight do find where the rain in the City of Tears is coming from. There's a bright blue lake directly overhead the city, which is causing the rain to fall down. 
We eventually meet him at the lake and his voice is hoarse and old sounding. He tells the knight that after seeing the world twice over, he feels finally at peace and he's thankful he could see its beauty once again. Sitting next to him in silence was one of the best moments in the game for me, as it captures exactly why Hollow Knight is special. It's a mysterious, depressing, dark game, with hope, beauty, heartbreak, and majesty to it all the same. It has times that make you sad, times that make you think, and it just so happens to be an incredibly fun game, too.